Hello, everyone, and welcome to Archie of Icon. As this month is Black History Month, I have decided to take a break from my Origins of Modern East Asia series in order to make three videos in honor of Black History. Today is going to be the first of those videos, and it is on the subject of the rise of early complex societies in West Africa, a subject that is often overlooked by people outside of academia, and even in a lot of cases outside of the specialized field involving the history of complex societies in West Africa, in favor of other civilizations and societies such as, say, ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, ancient China, uh, and even in some cases, ancient India. And when that happens, uh, it takes away from the deep and complex and fascinating history that exists within Af the African continent as a whole, but also West Africa itself, uh, with many of these societies being every bit as complex and sophisticated as some civilizations like ancient Egypt uh, and ancient Greece and others that I mentioned. And of course, you know, when we hear the term Africa, uh, we don't really generally, in our a lot of times in our modern minds, think of regions like, say, West Africa uh, or, say, the Swahili coast or anything like that. We think of generally the whole continent itself. And if we do think of regions, generally it's relegated to regions like, say, uh, when we're talking about, like, the Somali pirates or uh, North Africa uh, in terms of its connection with the Mediterranean and the Middle East, or, of course, regions like South Africa that were once British colonies. <laughs> uh, and, of course, that sort of diminishes... No, so, sorry, it doesn't sort of... It definitely diminishes the deep and complex um, and fruitful abundant history of these uh, countries and empires and civilizations that rose within Africa. Uh, and of course, you know, when we think of Africa, the empires we immediately draw our minds to, uh, and civilizations we immediately draw our minds to, are civilizations like, say, ancient Egypt, which is known for the Egyptian Empire and monuments such as the Great Sphinx and the Great Pyramid of Giza, or, say, the Carthaginian Empire, uh, known for its wars with ancient Rome and the beautifully constructed city of Carthage, which the empire is named after. Uh, but, again, as I said, that, that too diminishes from the rest of the continent, because all of those empires I just mentioned, both of those empires I just mentioned, were specifically... Uh, you know, contained in North Africa and really even the northernmost edge of North Africa, uh, because, of course, a good chunk of North Africa is the Sahara Desert, which is a little bit of an ironic name because Sahara means desert, so it's really mean, its name really means desert desert, but whatever. Um, but yes, that most of those empires I mentioned were just contained to North Africa. And because in because of that hyper focus, we avoid all of the other empires that rose here, uh, many of which actually overlapped with each other or immediately succeeded each other. Like say the Mali Empire that is here in the sort of light green, being succeeded and overlapped by the larger Songhai Empire, or uh, say. The Nok culture, which we will talk about in this video, overlapping overlapping with other cultures such as the Hosa, uh, and those like of the uh, and I apologize if I mispronounce this of the Igbo culture um, and things like that, or empires that were uh, further south, like say the Empire of Great Zimbabwe, which I will do a video about, or uh, the Swahili Coast, etc. So. It's really become a hyper-focus at a detriment to most of Afri African history. 
which is why I'm doing this uh, this video here. Okay, so with that out of the way, with the background out of the way, we're going to take a look at the earliest sort of uh, cultural group that began to uh, began to arise. Sorry, not the earliest cultural group, the earliest definable complex society that we can, uh, distinguishable complex society that we can see in West Africa. And before I move on, I do want to preface this, that uh, as you can see, there were a lot more, there are a lot of cultures that arose in West Africa. This video uh, one will be unable to cover all of them, otherwise it would be a, uh, uh, like a seven hour long video, uh, but we will still cover a good chunk of them. So again, as I said, we're you know, the first distinguishable complex society that began to arise in West Africa was the Tichit culture. So the Tichit culture arose, uh, or at least began to arise, in the modern day country of Mauritania in West Africa, or at least the region that makes up the modern day country of Mauritania in West Africa. And it was defined by a set of several uh, large village or sort of city-state sites within the region uh, in between the uh, rainforest and the Sahara Desert known as the Sahil, uh, with many of the Dar uh, with many of the Tichit culture sites, such as Dar Tichit or Dar Walata, uh, Dar Nina, being in between the uh, Niger River and the Senegal River floodplain and valley plains. Uh, and the two largest and seems to be most important sites of the Tichit culture or the Dar Tichit culture or, uh, and again, I apologize if I butcher this, uh, Akrajit and the Dakhla al Atrus uh, villages or cities. Though, of course, many of the other cities, such as Dar uh, Taganat, uh, or Taganat uh, and Dar Tichit itself, etc., were also located fairly close to each other and fairly close to river regions, as you can see here. And the Tichit culture had a very long-lived uh, cultural lifespan, with the pre-Tichit phase uh, beginning roughly around 2600 BCE to 1900 BCE, uh, and the early Tichit culture, uh, sorry, the pre-Tichit culture beginning around 2600 to 1900 BCE, um, being mobile herders and hunter-gatherers that lived in small temporary campsites, uh, and by the early Tichit culture in 1900 BCE, uh, lasting through 1600 BCE, uh, they began to cultivate crops such as pearl millet, um, though still had a considerable, considerable degree of mobility. Uh, and by the classical Tichit period, 1600 to 1000 BCE, they developed uh, settlements, um, you know, large villages, small city-states. Uh, and by the late Tichit culture, they began, began to see, uh, unfortunately for them, uh, a period of intense aridification as the Sahara Desert actually began to expand and become much more harsh. And of course, by, as you can see here, by the terminal Tichit, or like the, basically the very end of it, around between 400 BCE, and uh, generally it's accepted 300 BCE, though one could argue uh, later cultures uh, a little bit further south, like say in Mali, still were somewhat in that Tichit culture, cultural phase, uh, so one could argue it went on to uh, 200 CE, though it seems more likely the uh, Tichit culture officially ended and transformed into a different, or transitioned into a different culture around 400 to 300 BCE. And that's when div uh, complex stonewalled settlements with uh, evidence of iron metallurgy begin to really take off, though as we'll talk about in a minute, there was evidence of iron metallurgy uh, during the Tichit culture as well. Okay, so in the Tichit culture, 
as I said, we begin to see the development of complex village societies uh, with many of the uh, settlement uh, sites being located around these river basins right here with the bigger circle uh, with bigger black dots with circles around them being regional uh, centers uh, and then you had smaller black dots that were uh, district centers and then they went on down to small hamlets and these village sites uh, were actually they actually showed evidence of essentially what were neighborhoods as you can see in this uh, outline this uh, settlement plan there are various little tiny neighborhoods and living communities all squished in together with some being larger than others um, and they also had evidences, evidence of enclosures for things such as cattle and other uh, domesticated animals as well as funerary tumuli or funerary mounds and things like that And as, as we continue with the neighborhoods, uh, as you can see here, here in uh, the site, uh, I believe, uh, do, uh, I believe it is Doclet uh, El Atrus, uh, as you can see here, um, the general size of some of the neighborhoods with this picture over here showing just the individual enclosures themselves, uh, with the one below it showing sort of which neighborhoods or which, like which ones could be determined to be a single neighborhood. Uh, and it's generally believed based off of the archaeological evidence that these neighborhoods were communal, uh, or were essentially communal neighborhoods or, or like for large family groups who were living together. Uh, so this large neighborhood would be one family group and this neighborhood would be another, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this is further evidenced by the fact that there are several large uh, burial mounds or tumuli uh, that are probably, say, communal burial mounds within these large neighborhoods themselves. And there is also evidence of social stratification uh, or social inequality within these sites as well, based off of the archaeological evidence, and looking through the archaeological evidence, archaeologists using both the Gini coefficient, uh, and the, uh, which is essentially determining, uh, how, you know, how uh, in, unequal or an even or socially stratified a society is, uh, based off of a, a numbering system of zero to one, so like zero and then like say 0 0.4 and then one being the highest, uh, and then the Lorenz asymmetry coefficient, which determines which of these little neighborhoods or family groups is contributing the most to this uh, social stratification. Here's some more, like an up-close view of some of those uh, complex subdivisions that you see here. And as you can see, based off of that evidence, uh, various societies, uh, the, these Tichik culture villages and, and uh, societies were fairly uh, socially stratif uh, stratified, as you can see here, with zero being the lowest, and as you can see on this picture uh, of uh, the uh, city or village site, uh, Daklet El Atrus, um, there is really no village, uh, no neighborhood that is in the zero category. They're all either uh, within the yellow, uh, with some actually being well uh, <laughs> in the red in terms of uh, social stratification, and then over here on this map, you can see uh, the ones over here in the light blue, which are contributing the least to the, the social stratification, and the ones over here way in the deep, dark, or sort of uh, dark blue area that are contributing the most to so social stratification, which are generally these ones right here uh, in the 44 or 92 range, or even 60 range, showing essentially which neighborhoods were <laughs> you know, the best. Uh, and, sorry, I don't want to say the best. That's, that's wrong. That was very wrong of me. Showing which ones were the highest status of um, the village sites. Um, 
etc. And then you can see based off of these graphs, sort of which uh, of the main sort of um, regional centers was more uh, socially stratified and uh, essentially the unevenness value of uh, Doclet Elatrus, uh, do essentially Doclet Elatrus uh, was more socially stratified than, say, uh, Acrogit. And again, I apologize to anyone from West Africa or anyone who, in this field uh, for any possible mispronunciation of this. Uh, but anyways, as I was saying, uh, so essentially Dakla El Atrus was the main regional center with uh, Acrogit and other uh, large village, village sites, city-states being, um, sub I don't want to say subservient, but sort of lower on the uh, on the rung, on the ladder of social stratification. And here's sort of a more, uh, another graph showing the coefficient of class di uh, divisions uh, that you can see here. And here's another graph showing more of the general mean and size and uh, social stratification of the various neighborhoods and compounds. Uh, and here is an interesting graph showing how socially stratified, uh, stratified um, the uh, cities of uh, the village sites of uh, Dhaka El Trus and Akrajit were in comparison to other uh, large city, large village sites and cities uh, that were contemporary uh, or others that were like later even in the medieval period um, of the world uh, with like all the way at the bottom on this list in terms of the least socially stratified being uh, cities like Teotihuacan and uh, Yinjing, uh, Xiaxing uh, from China um, and uh, some of the most socially stratified being cities like say uh, Dadi Vaughan uh, in China, uh, or Pompeii in the Roman Empire, uh, Tikal over the classical Maya, uh, etc., etc. And as you can see here, um, uh, Akrajit uh, is still pretty decently high, or at least smack dab in the middle, um, compared to a lot of these cities, like say. Uh, uh, Akrajit was more socially stratified than the village city site San Jose Mogote uh, in Mexico, uh, but it is still less socially stratified than Dakla El Trus and others below, above it, uh, and less socially stratified than, say, Maya Pong uh, from the post classical Maya period in Mexico or uh, Tel Sabi. Abayad uh, in the Neolithic period of Syria. So you can see sort of just sort of the the mix of social stratification in the Tichit culture and see that they were actually pretty socially stratified, uh, stratified even compared to um, other large civil, civilized, uh, other large um, complex civilizations and uh, including the Maya uh, and pretty close in terms of social stratification to uh, places such as ancient Rome. And so what that means, what all that information altogether means, is that essentially the regional, the main regional center or capital of the Tichet culture was uh, Dakla El Atrus, uh, with the large district centers uh, being uh, large field sites or city states such as uh, Akrajit, uh, Tijot, uh, Chikaba, and then going on down to the small villages and hamlets, with the small villages and hamlets uh, giving tribute to the uh, district centers. Uh, and of course, the district centers giving tribute to uh, the main regional center, Doclet El Atrus. Uh, El Tus, sorry, um, and Doclet El Tus in return for this tribute giving prestige goods which would go down uh, further, uh, at least in theory, to these small hamlets, which is a pretty big indicator of a 
civilization, or at least a civilization in the terms of, in the traditional terms of thinking. Of course, civilization is a loaded term that many archaeologists and historians, myself included, are trying to move away from. But if we're going to look at it in its most literal terms, this is a pretty big indicator of a very early civilization in West Africa. And we have evidence of large-scale uh, stone tool making in sites such as Dar Nema uh, over here. Um, and here are some of the tools that they would have made. Uh, and these were would have been made both in the pre uh sites uh, generally, uh, but also the early Tichet uh, and even possibly the classical Tichet sites. Uh, they also made beautiful ceramics that you can see here. Uh, many of them, what we would call, like say in America, like corded ware or things like that. But of course, they have uh, different names for here that you can see here. Oh, actually, no, uh, corded wrap stick ware and things like that. So yeah, but uh, so you can see just how uh, sophisticated and beautiful their pottery would have been. Uh, and here's sort of a graph of some of the uh, the sheer amount of stone tools that they would have made. Down here, you may see things like iron slag and iron fragment. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but they, they produced quite a lot of stone tools during much of their early and classical periods, um, showing large-scale uh, cooperation. Uh, because in order to make this amount of stone tools, you would have to have like stone, what we call uh, like stone tool, stone tool workshops or things like that. Um, which one would, in order to make, have that many workshops to make this many tools, of course, you would need some sort of uh, social hierarchy and some sort of complex uh, system of uh, society in order to um, gather and uh, supervise enough people to make these tools. Uh, and here's a graph of how much pottery uh, and ceramics were generally made, uh, as you can see, quite a lot, which again is the same with the stone tools. You know, you would have to be able to supervise a large amounts of human labor uh, in order to produce this much pottery uh, on a grand scale, um, especially for a complex civil uh, society or civilization, which again, this is makes sense based off of what we know. And we can also get a general look based off the archaeological data of generally sort of the types of food that the Tichet culture was eating. And they ate a lot of things like uh, warthog, giraffe, uh, but also, uh, you know, wild animals like warthogs and giraffe and antelope, but also uh, the beginnings of domestic animals such as domestic dogs and cows, you know, small, medium bovid, large, medium bovid, large bovid, etc. So meaning they were already beginning to domesticate uh, cattle and other animals. We also have archaeological evidence from sites such as uh, Batan uh, in the Tichet area of uh, granaries, uh, essentially millstones to grind grain, uh, as well as bases of granaries on stilts. Uh, some are on high platforms like this, but there are also some that are on low platforms as well, meaning that they had large, they were s storing food uh, like s such as grain and even meats possibly on a large scale, which would make sense. You would have to do that in order to feed large populations. And we can see further evidence of sort of how they cooked based off of hearths that they found uh, inside village compounds, uh, as well as they found evidence of uh, the control of water sources based off of dams uh, and dam walls found on the slopes of sites such as Dar, uh, and again, apologies for possibly mispronouncing this, uh, Oalata. Uh, which was near a small village, meaning that they could they were controlling and distributing water for these large village sites on very large scales. I mean, you can see the size of these walls, these damn walls here. 
Uh, and then now we're coming back around to what I said we would cover in just a minute. Uh, in that graph of stone tools, you saw uh, it meant the, the uh, you saw iron slag and iron fragments mentioned, and that's because towards the classical and toward, and the uh, in the classical and towards the end of the Tichet period, we actually begin to see the use of uh, iron and essentially an iron age because unlike say in in Egypt or the Mediterranean uh, below the Sahara Desert there was no Bronze Age it was only Iron Ages because iron was much more abundant and so as you can see right here um, there uh, are several slag mounds where iron was found and they were distributed in a very pretty wide area. And our best ev the best evidence for the Tichet culture's use of iron and other metals, uh, and other iron metals, uh, actually comes from uh, the act of grinding uh, grains such as millet, which we, of course, as we've said, had, as I mentioned earlier, we have evidence of you know, from grinding basins like this one seen here on the map, as well as granary basins, along with, of course radiocarbon dates from organic materials uh, from potsherds such as like pearl temp uh, pearl millet tempers and things like that along with uh, unsurprisingly uh, large furnaces that were found as I mentioned in an earlier map with uh, samples of slag taken from those mounds uh, and you can actually see the evidence of grinding of grains in uh, uh, in some of the slides that were found. So you can see uh, uh, on this sample of slag uh, or you know grains uh, or grains uh, caked in, um, as well as into this one uh, with the typical. Uh, slag microstructure that was without uh, evidence of breaking down grains looking generally like this. So pretty good evidence uh, that they were using this iron to grind uh, grain material like millet. Uh, and of course, uh, and, and, well, sorry, not of course, unsurprisingly, uh, the Tichet culture, as would later cultures do, uh, was able to become very wealthy uh, and develop a large trade network with other civilizations, such as uh, the civilizations of ancient Egypt and Carthage, thanks to their uh, monopoly of the gold trade because West Africa is very uh, very abundant with gold ore, gold mines and things like that. So of course the Tichet and later other cultures such as the Ghana Empire would monopolize these gold mines uh, and would trade gold along these trade routes that you see here in return for prestige goods that they could not did not have available to them in West Africa. And eventually, the Tichet culture, as you saw in the original graph, would decline due to the increasing aridification of the Sahara Desert uh, and its increasing range. Uh, but with that, we now move on to the next culture uh, in this video, the Nok culture. So... Uh, the Nok culture, which ran from around 1500 BC, uh, existing from around 1500 BCE to 500 CE, so itself was also a very long-lived cultural society. So the origins of the Nok culture are currently unknown by archaeologists. They sort of, in the archaeolog archaeological record, just show up, um, not necessarily out of nowhere. It's just there's not enough archaeological evidence before them to determine when they showed up. No, not aliens in it for anyone watching. <clears throat> but generally the nut culture arose in this area around the uh, in between the Niger the Niger and the Bennu River system and here uh, in the modern day country of Nigeria. 
or the region that would make up, uh, eventually make up the modern day region of Nigeria. And the Nut culture had within that region a, a large amount of sites that were fairly farly, that were distributed in a fairly, fairly wide range in that area. I mean, here it is right here, and you can see the various village sites uh, with some that were recorded in red, uh, those that were excavated in green, um, uh, and the blue indicating, unfortunately, for the sites, uh, looted sites. Because, of, of course, uh, the illicit looting of uh, archaeological sites, for those of you who watched uh, the group talk that I had with other archaeologists, is has always been a problem and is actually becoming a larger problem uh, due to things like the recent pandemic. And the Nut culture is in particularly famous for their beautifully designed uh, and very incredibly interesting sculptures uh, that you see here that are generally of human faces. And they're a little bit abstract, of course, with uh, very long faces, uh, uh, with like this one sort of being as long as a dog uh, and things like that. And it's just sort of typical of the Nook culture, uh, archaeology, of the Nook culture artwork. And I do want to say, I want to make sure, this does not mean that the Nook the people of the Nut culture look like this. <laughs> the people, the descendants of the Nut culture are pretty possibly determined to be, you know, much of what makes up modern, you know, the societies of modern day West Africa. And of course they don't look like this. So do not look at this artwork and decide to like, ha, they're not, you know, whatever, or aliens or what have you because of the way their artwork looks. I mean, think about, uh, Picasso or Salvador Dali. So art can be abstract. Uh, and that's exactly what this is. This is abstract art, and it is very fascinating and beautifully designed abstract art that the nut culture produced in thousands and thousands of examples. Uh, and the nut culture uh, actually show evidence of, over the course of their uh, of their 1500 year uh, 1300 year existence uh, transitioning from uh, small scale uh, fishing uh, and hunter gathering uh, to small scale food production with that food production increasing from uh, 1800 BC to 1400 BCE um, and eventually encompassing an even larger area by 1000 BCE uh, with some farming and hunter gathering still existing and fishing, sorry, some fishing and hunter gathering still existing, uh, and actually some settled farming beginning to exist, which you saw here as well, uh, but you really see that to begin to increase around 1000 BCE. Uh, and then it like quadruples by 200 BCE uh, with small scale food production and settled farming uh, essentially taking up much with small scale farming essentially taking up most of the area uh, and of course this includes other cultures like the Tichit culture uh, but uh, small scale food production taking up the entire area under the Sahara Desert uh, oh sorry 600 BCE it begins to expand and by 200 BCE it takes up the whole area and then uh, by uh, 600 CE uh, uh, settled diversified farming makes up the majority of the area uh, by you know of the area below South Africa and above the Ameri uh, above the rainforest in Central Africa. And we can see evidence of this increasing use of farming of course by uh, Archaeobotanical analysis, finding grain seeds in, um, in cooking pits and in pottery uh, and things like that. Uh, we actually have the um, the carbon fourteen and the archaeobotanical like makeup of a lot of a lot of the different types of foods uh, and crops they would use. With in fact, um, many of the modern fruits that are eaten now in uh, the West African region being very similar to archaeological seeds seen here, 
uh, uh, yeah, archaeological seeds seen here dating from the Nock period, meaning that many of the domestic plants that you see here uh, that were used by the Nock culture would see con continuity in use throughout the modern period, um, meaning they farmed or at least produced food in small scale production quite a lot. Uh, and here's sort of a general map of the sites uh, throughout West Africa with archaeobotanical remains uh, and sort of these types of species they would use uh, with, uh, here, with the gray uh, being things like wild fruits and etc, uh, etc, cetera, et cetera, and yellow being generally like pearl millet, what have you. So as you can see, West Africa by this period actually began to see widespread food production, uh, and the nut culture, of course, was part of that. Uh, here's the uh, charcoal analysis of the various types of food and plants that were found in charcoal pits within the nut uh, cultural distribution that you see here. But one of the most interesting food ways that the nut culture uh, is shows evidence of of uh, participating in is found in these sites that you see here uh, within the Nuk cultural area. Uh, here is the little square right here within the deep right smack dab in the center of the Nuk cultural uh, oval sphere, uh, and these are the sites illuminated here and. In these sites, uh, residues of things such as beeswax were found in pottery samples like this that show that, uh, that essentially the Nulk culture, the various village sites, uh, small city sites, were actually uh, collecting bee, mater bee uh, food materials such as uh, beeswax and honey and things like that. Uh, and you can see the amount of pot sherds that were found and the lipid yieldings in a lot of the pot sherds. And the majority of this honey collection seems to have been happening uh, in between the 15th century BCE uh, right around to the 5th century BCE uh, that you see here. And here, here's another graph of that, uh, and, it's, and it shows the typical lipid beeswax profiles that you see here. And interesting enough, interestingly enough, uh, many of these beeswax honey lipid profiles that were found in these pots were also found in conjunction with meat uh, proteins, with proteins from various uh, animals, uh, animal fats and things like that, suggesting that uh, very similar to modern West African cooking that involves uh, mixing honey with meats, uh, that they too would store honey with meats in these pots, which could in, could be done for one, you know, uh, flavor because who doesn't love like say honey ham, and, at least in America, uh, or it could be done for preservation because honey is generally antibacterial, meaning that it's a good way to both. Uh, uh, preserve food, but also can be used in medicinal purposes uh, on wounds and such. Um, it could have been either or, or both. I would argue both, but either way, it's incredibly interesting. Uh, and here's more of sort of the uh, uh, makeups and percentage, uh, percentage, percentages of these lipids and other proteins that were found with each other. Uh, and in fact, these honey collecting methods uh, and beeswax collecting methods are actually still continued by many societies in West Africa to this day, as you can see here, uh, of uh, uh, modern beehives from Uganda. And, of course, like the Tichit culture, uh, the nut culture also shows evidence of some degree of iron working, uh, as evidenced by furnaces uh, and 
samples taken from furnaces uh, and cultural depo uh, deposits, which you can see here in this graph with the iron uh, working uh, beginning around the 800 BCE, 400 BCE uh, time frame um, and continuing even into the 400 CE time frame, which makes sense because the Iron Age continued for a long time throughout the world. All right, so we've looked at the uh, very early Kichit and Nook cultures. Now we're going to look at a culture that arose a little bit later, uh, the Kivikongo culture, which existed um, r roughly from 700 BCE to um, around 1680 or 1600 CE. And the Kirikongo culture, the Kirikongo site, uh, is located uh, in the modern day country of Burkina Faso. Um, and that's literally the cultural homeland of the Kirikongo culture, as evidenced uh, via archaeology. Uh, with many of the uh, general sites existing within uh, the you know, being sites such as the Mahoan Ben sites, uh, or this region right here, uh, which was one of the main study regions of uh, the sources I used. Uh, and these Kirikongo sites uh, show, actually, in contrast to, say, the Tichit culture, they showcase evidence of a of non-centralized societies, as you can see here, or small-scale uh, small societies. Uh, with some of the, uh, and here's a map of the general ethnic groups that exist within uh, the modern day region of Burkina Faso that uh, were likely descended from the culture that built uh, the Kira Congo site. Uh, and the, it's the, and we can get the date for the Kira Congo site. Uh, from various uh, radiocarbon dates and charcoal dating, though of course many of these dates on this graph actually go to about start at about uh, 140 CE ish. But as as I stated, the archaeological evidence suggests it goes back to around 700 BCE. Uh, and of course, like both the Tichit culture and the Nook culture, we see uh, examples of beautifully designed ceramics coming from the Kirikongo sites, like you see here. As well as we find, uh, found uh, pottery burials uh, and pounded clay floors suggesting living areas uh, and even burial pits. Um, here's uh, some more pottery from surface collections. Uh, we also find evidence of, like the like the Nook culture and the Tichit culture, uh, we find evidence of iron working uh, with these black areas here uh, being in uh, habitation sites or occupation sites, and these yellow, yellow areas e here being evidence of iron working, uh, and they both are within pretty close proximity to cultural deposits uh, of the Kirikongo culture. Uh, and of course, this is evidenced by spears from the very late period of the Kirigongo culture uh, between, say, 200 CE to 1600 CE, uh, where we can find uh, iron spears in the archaeological record. And uh, of course, we can see evidence of, uh, of iron furnaces that you see here, that we found here, as well as various different burial and ceremonial mounds found throughout the area, indicating, of course, some degree of social complexity, which makes sense. Uh, and during their existence, the Karagongo culture uh, generally lived in uh, what they, they lived in the Niger River area, uh, with many of the sites, such as uh, Wunde Korojo Oest, again, apologies for possibly mispron uh, mispronouncing, being 
within this area right here that is now considered part of the Sahil. Uh, and it would have actually been a little more fertile at the period, or at least at the beginning of the Cura Congo phase. Uh, and as we begin to see by the first millennium CE uh, into the second millennium CE, uh, they begin to move a little bit further south, though not all of them. And this, in their placement in this region of the Sahil, uh, makes a decent amount of sense of, of what at the time would have been grassland savanna, at least, makes a lot of sense based off of what uh, was one of the most predominant artifacts uh, or cultural deposits, uh, objects found in cultural deposits. And that was the uh, dis distribution of cattle or bovid bones that you can see over here. There's quite a lot of uh, cattle bovid bones. Uh, figure one measures the uh, phalanges of uh, cattle uh, in West Africa. Uh, and yeah, of the first phalanges from uh, Central West Africa of cattle. Uh, and figure five down here uh, measures the uh, second phalanges of cattle in Central West Africa. And you can see over here sort of the distribution of cattle of the various uh, Kira Congo mound sites and village sites that you see here. Uh, here is more uh, a graph showing uh, the uh, various uh, measurements uh, of the uh, cattle phalanges, or at least the, uh, where measurements were possible. Uh, and what time period they generally dated to, uh, whether it would be pre-900 uh, CE or post-900 CE, etc., etc. Uh, and here's the uh, logarithmic size index for all of the cattle phalanges that you see over here uh, that you can take a look at and see over here uh, with uh, the Adrarbos uh, being at the top and the uh, Kintapo 6 being at the bottom. And this, and again, this makes sense that they were uh, cultivating and domesticating cattle because of the various uh, river and drainage systems that made the site, um, the sites a lot more fertile. Uh, and of course, there were also, it makes sense also, as you can see right here, known uh, church sources uh, for them to uh, settle near known church sources in order for them to be able to make tools to put your cattle in. Uh, but it wasn't actually just cattle that they uh, domesticated. As you can see here, uh, there was also evidence of other domestic livestock, uh, not just bovid. Um, but also uh, rodents, um, primates, uh, some carnivore, uh, avian, reptile, snails, uh, you know, both freshwater, you had freshwater bivalves and fish that made up a good chunk of their uh, food, uh, of their food items. Uh, and this graph shows uh, the various different types of these animals that I just mentioned that were, uh, that existed uh, with, you know, there being uh, domestic cattle, uh, domestic sheep and goat. Um, uh, you had uh, chickens, uh, guinea fowl that were being domesticated and used as well. You had servals and mongoose and other carnivores that were used. Uh, patas monkeys, uh, along with, of course, you know, uh, they had um, grasses and fruits and seeds and things like that that would be fed to these animals. Uh, they also ate uh, monster lizards uh, and other reptiles, uh, freshwater snails, um, fish such as perch and catfish, uh, and lungfish as well. So they had a fairly diverse diet of animals they both domesticated and fished out of rivers. However, as this graph shows, uh, for most of the sites um, and most of the time periods, uh, with uh, terrestrial animals outnumbered 
uh, aquatic animals in terms of how much they ate, though, of course, there were always exceptions to the rule, uh, which it means that uh, cattle, uh, much like the Tichet culture, was being domesticated fairly early in West Africa as compared to uh, both in conjunction and as compared to other places. Uh, and you can see here sort of the archaeological map of uh, when uh, th uh, of uh, when these food sources began to be utilized, um, with generally one pit uh, being found uh, and dated around uh, 100 to 500 CE, and then by 500 CE, the amount of domesticated animal bones uh, that and that were being found began to double, uh, as well as in conjunction with smelting furnaces that you can see here. Uh, so generally, this domestication of cattle began to take off around the middle of the Kirokongo culture's existence. Uh, and here's more, and you can see that by 700 to 1100 CE, that is when they began to use chickens, at, le at least that early. Uh, and then by 1100 to 1450 CE, towards the end of the Karakongo culture's existence, they began to adopt other domestic animals, such as goats uh, and sheep. And... Uh, what's also interesting and unsurprising, uh, much like the uh, Tichet and Nok cultures, uh, especially the Tichet culture, the Kirikongo culture uh, began to make itself wealthy off of a monopoly of salt mines, uh, where they began to, use, to produce salt, um, especially in these regions here, though, of course, as you can see, the Nok region uh, also had some monopoly over salt production. Um, and much like the Tichet culture, they would, uh, these cultures, the Nok and the Karakonga, would harvest the salt and would send them up along the trade routes up to areas like the Middle East and the Mediterranean in return for other luxury goods. The next culture we're going to look at in this video is the Jenei Jeno culture, which existed as a recognizable, definable culture from around 250 BCE to 1400 CE. Originating in the modern African country of Mali, uh, the Jenei Jeno culture built their settlements, uh, their large villages, city-states, if you will, around the middle to lower Niger River Valley. Uh, Here's a map of sort of their settlement clusters that you can see here, uh, many of them very large-scale villages. Uh, in fact, um, because of the, the uh, because the Niger River tends to flood annually, many of, though not all, these, uh, but many of these village sites would actually were actually built on higher elevations uh, to avoid these annual floods, which makes sense because uh, for a variety of reasons. Because one, you do want to generally live near, or oftentimes ancient cultures would want to li generally live near uh, rivers that would flood annually because those floods would actually deposit silt in the soil. Uh, and actually make the soil much more fertile for future farming and other agriculture. Uh, so, of course, you would want to settle there. However, you would not want your houses or what have you right by the river. So, you're, Because if you did that, your village would be destroyed <laughs> if the river flooded. Uh, well, sorry, when the river flooded. The Jena Jena culture was also connected culturally uh, to certain uh, to some degree with the Dia Shoma cultures and it, and their clustered sites that you see here, which were also on the Niger uh, River Valley, with uh, the Middle Niger being up here and the Dia Heartland being just slightly south of the Middle Niger Valley, if not in it, much like the uh, Jena Jena culture was as well. And um, much like the uh, Kirikongo and the uh, the Kirikongo, the Nok, and the Tichet cultures, 
the Jenny Geno culture uh, built large villages, city states uh, with uh, well designed brick walls and uh, stone buildings. In fact, here is a design of a Jenny Geno site right here. Uh, and here are some designs from the excavations of some of the houses from Jenny Geno sites. And you can see right here how sturdy the walls would have been and sort of the makeup of the walls, which of course was stone. Which as much with the uh, with all the three cultures that we talked about previously in the video, that requires a lot of uh, social cooperation and a lot of manpower to build these types of stone wall structures, uh, at least on a grand scale, like we know the Jenny Geno did. In fact, uh, the Jenny Geno, uh, over the course of um, anywhere between uh, nine and 1200 years or so, again from 250 BCE onwards, uh, actually began to expand and grow in population and urbanization um, with their homeland in uh, 0 CE or 1 CE being right around here. And then they began to expand into the gray areas, the light gray areas around 300 CE and into the white area that you see here by around 800 CE. With urbanization by 800, between 800 and 1100 CE, uh, increasing exponentially, um, with many village sites becoming bigger and much more populated during that time period. And because of this, uh, because of the sophistication, and perhaps unsurprisingly because of the sophistication, the Jenna Geno, um, again, much like the Karakongo, the Nook, and the Tichit cultures, are connected uh, to the sort of Saharan trade networks with, uh, or the Trans-Saharan, Trans-African trade networks with trade items such as glass, uh, such as beads made of glass and precious stones, as well as brass and copper anklets being found in graves from Jenny Geno sites, such as the Kissy site in Burkina Faso. Uh, and there, the various things that they would trade would include, as I just mentioned, uh, copper and brass, uh, precious stones, but as you can see in this diagram here of the trading sphere of the uh, Jenny Geno uh, divided into the categories of immediate, intermediate, and distance could range anywhere between, say, uh, in the, um, the immediate area, wool, rice, cattle, sorghum, etc., uh, intermediate, uh, millet, iron, cattle, uh, rope, and then in the distance they would trade things like, trade four things like gold, salt, and copper, and such, um, and decorative stone, uh, or the, and they would trade out other things uh, like, say, indigo or what have you uh, in return for these objects. So a very large-scale uh, trade network that the Geno Geno were able to take advantage of um, with, as you can see over here, the distance being roughly around um, between 50 to 1,000 kilometers. Uh, so very extensive trade network uh, and a trade network in basically every direction. Uh, in fact, because of this trade network, the and also because of the urbanization, uh, the Jenna Jenna culture began to have villages that specialized in one specific um, trade item or one specific agricultural item. Uh, so like, say, this circle right here uh, specialized in agriculture, metallurgy, and uh, imports, uh, like symbolic and re religious items, or this circle over here was fishing, again, imports and metallurgy. Some were specifically agriculture. Some were basically all of these categories that you see here, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which is something that what you would expect from a complex society, uh, like, uh, for example, the North Sea cultures, like the uh, Danes, the Norwegians, 
and the Swedes and such, all the people involved in the Viking Age, there were villages that had specializations, or say in China, or some villages specialized in timber or silk or what have you, or, or in Rome, where some specialized in masonry and shipbuilding, etc., etc. So this is actually not surprising at all to see that uh, as the genogeno culture began to urbanize and grow in complexity, they also began to grow, have villages that grew into specialization. Um, which, of course, that's the whole point of this video, to show that these cultures in Africa were every bit as advanced and uh, sophisticated and complex as other cultures. Uh, and eventually, how eventually, however, the Gene Geno culture would decline uh, gradually, and many of these urban centers by 1400 CE would uh, they would begin to decline around 1100 CE, and eventually, uh, the urban settlements would be abandoned by roughly 1400 CE. And now, now we move on to the final culture that we're going to talk, into, uh, talk about in this video, the Bura culture, <laughs> which is a culture that we know even less about than the Gene Geno culture. So the Bura culture uh, existed roughly between 300 CE to 1200 CE. Uh, and the Bura culture uh, arose uh, in the modern-day country of Nigeria and the Niger Delta, uh, as well as in Burkina Faso over here as well. Uh, and they were contemporary, uh, at least through some of their existence, with other societies such as the Gao Empire and the Mali Empire, both of which will get their own videos later on down the line. And in the arc. In the archaeological record, uh, the Bura culture has shown evidence of ironworking uh, as seen by these rather mean-looking iron arrowheads that have hooks at the end, which I'm sure were done to make it more difficult to pull out, uh, whether it be for warfare or in hunting, essentially like that way I um, say uh, a antelope or what have you uh, can't pull the thing out or knock it out. Um, uh, but either way, whatever they're used for, it's clear that they produced these items and were really good at it because these are incredibly well-made uh, iron arrowheads. And we, of course, have evidence of uh, the use of precious stones such as quartzite and tiger eye and other stones being turned into jewelry, whether it be for personal use, such as prestige, or for trade, like many of the West African cultures use them for, uh, as well as the fact that they produce beautiful uh, brass bracelets and nose rings, like you see here, uh, that, again, could be used for both personal use or long-distance trade. But one of the most uh, characteristic, uh, one, of one of the most uh, endemic characteristics of the Burr culture was, uh, similar to the Nut culture, the production of uh, clay figurines like these you see here. Um, some are uh, long-headed figures, others are uh, flat faces, uh, as well as the production of beautiful burial urns. Um, with some, uh, say, depicting, uh, as it says right here on the left, female, uh, female genitalia, uh, or rounded urns that you see over here, uh, or urns like this, um, and, you know, another rounded urn with sort of, uh, bumpy rock, uh, spike marks, or, uh, rounded, this oval urn over here with a human face on it. Um, beautifully designed urns that were, as as their name suggests, were used for uh, burial, uh, whether it be, you know, essentially cremation, very similar to what modern societies do today. Uh, and of course, as I said, some burial urns even just had heads attached to them, so it was sort of like, you know, pull the head out as like a cork, and that's where the ashes go in. Um, which again is very similar to how a lot of urns are nowadays. 
Um, and, and these were, as I said, very beautifully done uh, and suggest, and it's very, um, very suggestive of the type of burial practices that the Burra culture used. Now, it should be noted that it's not 100% sure how much influence the Burr culture uh, had on other cultures or how much influence uh, the very powerful uh, Muslim empires such as uh, Ghana, Mali, and Songhai and other empires had on the Burr culture. As we said, there's not, uh, not a lot is known about them other than their artifacts, but it is clear that uh, they were contemporary with these societies and at least had some degree of trade and contact with them, and they had very well-developed and complex burial practices as evidenced by their burial art. As along with, of course, uh, iron smelting, suggests which is, which is suggestive of how uh, I, I, I hate to say technologically advanced because that in itself is a little term, but how, uh, but I'm going to have to say it just in this case, but how technologically advanced they were. So, okay, so with that, we have covered uh, the earliest society in West Africa, societies in West Africa, the Tichit cultures, and their development of large scale village. Uh, uh, large-scale villages and city-states. Uh, we talked about the Nunk culture uh, and their um, and, and how they uh, were contemporary with the Tichit culture to some degree uh, in their development of agriculture and their uh, creation of abstract art within their own culture, their abstract figurines. Uh, as well as their farming practices and ironworking practices, and to me, still the most uh, interesting of their uh, agricultural practices, the collection of honey for the use uh, in the storage of meat. Uh, and then, of course, we've talked about the rise of intense, uh, the intensification of cattle domestication in the region during the Kirakongo culture. Uh, as well as other domesticated animals like sheep and chicken uh, in the Kirakongo culture's monopolization of the salt trade, which was very similar to the Tichit culture's monopolization of the gold trade. Uh, and then we've talked about the Jene Jeno cultures and the Burra cultures, both of which had their own complex uh, artworks and trade networks. Uh, and, and in the case of the Jene Jeno, their own evidence of large-scale villages uh, with large populations that were possibly trade centers, uh, though of course we know less about the Jene Jena culture and the Burra culture than we do of the Nok, uh, Kirakongo, and Tichit cultures. So with that, I, that ends the video. I hope you enjoyed the video, uh, and if you want me to cover uh, any of the cultures I mentioned in this video in greater detail, uh, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section. Um, uh, and I want to say look forward to the next couple of videos in my uh, three in the next two videos in my three video series for Black History Month. Uh, one of which is going to be about the earliest uh, distinguishable empire in West Africa, the Ghana Empire, and the other is going to be about the uh, city of Great Zimbabwe and its empire. Um, and so I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you will enjoy those videos. And remember to like, share, and subscribe. And I hope you all have a good day.